Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat, featuring me rambling on about stuff that interests me and wonderfully enabled by Judy Zerubic, who makes all the technology flow smoothly and makes me look better than I should without her. Thank you, Judy. By the way, Judy never fishes for compliments from me, and she is often embarrassed by my weekly thanks. However, here is a fellow who loves fit going fishing creatively. For those who like their passions in the kitchen, here's a quick hack for canning soup. For those of us who keep misplacing objects and even people, there may be a bigger picture causing it. See, that's what's happened when you get hammered. And when our hearing gets problematic, misunderstandings can easily abound. <laughs> of course, I have to have at least a few really bad puns. <clears throat> This is one for the parents among us who also appreciate art. Some of our pets have spent just too much time with us over the course of this pandemic. This past Sunday, our choir met in person for the first time in 18 months instead of on Zoom. Here is what we could have been taught. <clears throat> what I won't be quiet about this week are issues arising from our residential school system. This Thursday is our first official National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, which is also known as Orange Shirt Day. The story of the orange shirt I shared this past Sunday during worship, and it is a true story written by Phyllis Webstadt based on her own experience at residential school. Let me share a pared down residential school timeline to teach us as we learn about this sad chapter in our national history. 1620, for more than 200 years from the early 1600s to the 1800s, religious orders run mission schools for indigenous children, the precursors to the Government of Canada's residential school system. In 1831, run by the Anglican Church, the Mohawk Institute in Brantford becomes the first school in Canada's residential school system and eventually the largest. At first, the school only admits boys. In 1834, girls were admitted. In 1847, Egerton Ryerson's report on a system of public elementary instruction for Upper Canada was published. Ryerson recommends that Indigenous students continue to be educated in separate, agriculturally based boarding schools with religious and English language instruction. In 1857, the Gradual Civilization Act makes status Indian Métis over the age of 21 to read, write, and speak either English or French, and to choose a government-approved surname. The Act awards 50 acres of land to any sufficiently advanced Indigenous male, and in return removes any tribal affiliation or treaty rights. In 1867, under the Constitution Act, the British North American Act, the federal government takes authority over First Nations and land reserved for First Nations. That authority would later extend to education of status Indians. In 1876, the Indian Act is introduced, aiming to eradicate First Nations culture in favor of assimilation into Euro-Canadian society. In 1830, 1883, sorry, based on the recommendations of the Davin Report, Sir John A. Macdonald authorizes the creation of the residential school system, cutting ties to the children's culture. In 1884, amendments to the Indian Act provide for the creation of Indian residential schools, funded and operated by the Government of Canada 
in partnership with Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. Now, note that with the creation of the United Church of Canada in 1925, the Methodist residential schools and most of the Presbyterian residential schools, 15 in total, were run by the United Church. The Canadian government also bans traditional Indigenous ceremonies, including potlatches, powwows, and sun dances. In 1905, after visiting 35 residential schools, Dr. Peter Bryce, the Chief Medical Officer for Canada's Department of Interior and Indian Affairs from 1904 to 1921, reveals that Indigenous children are dying at alarming rates, with mortality in rates of enrolled students as high as 25%. This number climbs to 69% after students leave the schools. In 1922, Dr. Bryce publishes the story of a national crime, exposing the Canadian government's suppression of information on the health of Indigenous peoples. Dr. Bryce argues that the Ministry of Indian Affairs neglected Indigenous health needs, noting a criminal disregard for treaty pledges. In 1930, more than 80 institutions are op in operation across Canada, the most at any one time, with an enrollment of over 17,000 children. In 1934, after the government researches Inuit education, the Department of the Interior urges providing formal education to Inuit children. In 1948, four students are investigated for arson. Others reportedly cheer as they watch their school burn. This was one of dozens of fires set by students as a form of resistance. In 1951, the 60s scoop begins after amendments to the Indian Act give provinces jurisdiction over child welfare on reserves. Over the following decades, more than 20,000 First Nation, Métis, and Inuit children are scooped from their homes and adopted into predominantly non-Indigenous families, leaving many adoptees with a lost sense of cultural identity. Nakuset, is a well-known Indigenous activist and executive director of the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, is Cree from Lac La Ronge, Saskatchewan. As a young child, she was taken from her home in Thompson, Manitoba, and adopted into a Jewish family in Montreal. Let's explore a little bit more about Nakuset, this instant Jew from Montreal who is now a passionate advocate for Indigenous rights. She testified in June 2018 at the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry in Calgary. If any of you remember Jalen Wolf, who gave us the gift of her jingle dress dance in worship three summers ago, Jalen is a similarly passionate a young woman about the racism and misogyny revealed by the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. Now back to Nakaset. She testified for three days at the Viennes Commission. And if we could just pull the next uh, transition up, a public inquiry into the discrimination of Indigenous people of Quebec. She says that she is honored to spearhead and run the Cabot Square project since its inception and to co-found Resilience Montreal. She is dedicated to improving the lives of urban Indigenous people. These are real people, and we are learning about this in this residential school timeline. Now, back to our residential schools timeline. In 1966, 12 year old Chani Wenjack dies after escaping from the Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School near Shoal Lake in Ontario. This is a picture of Chani's sister Pearl with Gord Downey. Gord wrote the album, The Secret Path, to remember Chani with Pearl's blessings and encouragement. The remembrance of Chani was important to highlight the coroner's inquest into Chani Wenjack's death that was held. The all-white jury finds that residential schools cause 
tremendous emotional and psychological harms. The jury recommends that a study be made of the present Indian education and philosophy asking, is it right? In 1997, enrollment continues to decline throughout the 1990s until Groyer Hall is turned over to Aurora College in the summer of 1997, marking the end of the residential school system in the North. In 2007, the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement provides compensation to survivors based on the number of years they attended. Claims of sexual and physical abuse are assessed through an independent process. The agreement focuses on funding for Indigenous health and healing services while establishing the funds for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission releases its summary report characterizing Canada's treatment of Indigenous peoples as cultural genocide. The report includes 94 calls to action aimed at redressing the legacy of residential schools and assisting in the process of reconciliation. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau attends the ceremonial release of the Commission's final report, committing his government to implementing all of the 94 recommendations set out in the summary report. Sadly, in 2020, the Assembly of First Nations report card for the government's progress released in June of that year says that there has been little progress in 40 calls to action. It represents 43%. Only moderate progress in 35 calls to action. That represents 37%. And thankfully, significant progress in 19 calls to action, which is only one call to action out of five. In 2017, the federal government announces a settlement of $800 million with 60 scoop survivors. In 2019, the final report on the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls reveals persistent and deliberate human rights violations, giving 231 calls for justice. While the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report documented over 3,000 deaths at residential schools, over 6,000 unmarked graves have been revealed in North America so far this year. A sad legacy, indeed. As one Indigenous elder reminded us, dear Canadians, just so we are clear, our children are not being discovered or found, they are being recovered. This is why we need to listen to the truth-telling of First Nations peoples on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation this Thursday, so that we can learn to live with one another differently. After all, nothing in nature lives for itself. Rivers don't drink their own water, trees don't eat their own fruit, the sun doesn't shine for itself, a flower's fragrance is not for itself. Living for each other is the rule of nature. As many wise Indigenous elders are trying to tell us, dear white people, no one is asking you to apologize for your ancestors. We are asking you to dismantle the systems of oppression they built that you maintained and from which you benefit. Here is a seemingly innocent video featuring a blonde young girl who speaks articulately about her heritage and about her understanding of her place in the world. Through the video, she is teaching us some of her, our own history, but with hope and with generosity of spirit for reconciliation through truth telling. Hi, I'm Roby, and I'm 18. Most of my friends don't know what that means. Here's what I tell them. The Métis people started when a bunch of guys called the Voyageurs came here to the prairies to work the fur trade. 
Along the way, they met the First Nation people who had lived here for thousands of years. They helped the voyagers in their travels. Sometimes the voyagers even married some of the First Nation women. Their babies were a mix of both cultures. By the way, do you know where babies come from? I do. As the little babies grew up, they found it hard to fit in. They weren't exactly like their mom or their dad. And do you know what they called themselves? Métis, which means mixed. These were the founders, the first official generation of the Métis people. The generation of my great, 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 great grandparents. That's seven generations leading to me. Not all of them were happy to be Métis. Actually, it's kind of been a roller coaster ride. So the founders had babies. These babies grew up to be the proud generation. They grew up really happy to be Métis. Sadly, after many years of fighting for the right, Louis Riel and the Métis were defeated at the Battle of Etoche. So many things they worked so hard to build were burned to the ground. That made their babies the defeated generation. They had seen their parents, the proud generation, lose the fight. Even though they loved being Métis, they stayed pretty quiet about it. Their babies grew up in a world where being Métis was a really bad thing. They were the shamed generation. Everywhere they went, people said mean things just because they were Métis. Not fair. And that's why the shamed generation raised their babies to hide their Métis heritage. And this hidden generation got very good at hiding. Where are you guys? And guess what? They didn't even tell their babies who they were. Crazy! Mom, are you hiding anything from me? These babies are what I call the lost generation. Many of these guys didn't even know they were matey. But thankfully, to my mom's generation, born as lost, became the found. With some digging and excellent detective work, the found generation found out who we were again. Thanks, Mom. For the first time in a long time, many Métis kids are growing up proud to be Métis from day one. I love to play in the snow, do the jig. Someday my mom will teach me to be. Check out these moccasins my mom made me. So what's the lesson here? Knowing who we are and why we're proud of it makes us happy people. Happy people are nice to each other, and when we're nice to each other, only good things can happen. So that's the story of the Métis people. Next time, I'll tell you where babies come from. It's really weird. <laughs>
children are encouraged to make decisions, solve problems, and show personal responsibility. Adults modeled, nurtured, taught values, and gave feedback, but the children were given abundant opportunities to make choices without coercion. Generosity is to teach the importance of being generous and unselfish. In the words of a Lakota elder, you should be able to give away your most cherished possession without your heart beating faster. Ironically, the formerly forbidden celebration of potlatch was just such a practice and teaching of generosity. So instead of the performative acts like this lovely but mute crosswalk meant to proclaim that all children matter, what can we do to actively root our new learning about residential schools in our memory and in our living? This Thursday, September the 30th, start reading books by Indigenous authors. Review the 94 calls to action and commit to at least one of them. Watch online events raising issues of reconciliation. Identify and connect with local Indigenous organizations like Kate Croker United Church. And read Philip Webstad's book, The Orange Shirt Story, which, by the way, I have on my bookshelf. This has been a rather weighty reflection today. So I want to share with you a prayer that nestles into the healing power of our place of being in the midst of creation. It is written by Irish poet, author, priest, and philosopher John O'Donohue, who is best known for popularizing Celtic spirituality. It is titled, For One Who Is Exhausted. Let's pray. Immerse yourself in the heart of God's good creation and find your place of peace. You have been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you is relinquished. There is nothing left to do now but rest and patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken for the race of days. At first, your thinking will darken and sadness take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone who, of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you will return to yourself having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. Amen. A big thank you to Terry Boyd and David Skinner, who tag team getting these fireside chats up to our YouTube channel for you to access and watch. Without them, this wouldn't happen very easily at all. I want to leave you with a blessing, which also is from John O'Donohue from his book, to bless the space between us, and it is type, titled simply, Blessing. May you recognize in your life the presence of power and light of your soul. May you realize that you are never alone, that your soul in its brightness and belonging connects you intimately with the rhythm of the universe. May you have respect for your individuality and difference. May you realize that the shape of your soul is unique, that you have a special destiny here, that behind the facade of your life, there is something beautiful and eternal happening. May it be so. Until next week's Fireside Chat, have a great week. Bye-bye.